Hello, my friends. We are back for another session on room acoustics. We're talking mostly about sound isolation, acoustically controlling the room that allows sounds to go in and go out. And we're back here again with Walker Peak from Commercial Acoustics. How you doing, my friend? Thanks for having me. And we got this guy over here, Mr. Don. What's up? He's kind of the comic relief of the channel. Mm -hmm. So, Walker, I want to ask you a series of questions. I actually, I studied this time, my friends. I have a question sheet I want to ask because I don't want to forget. I think this topic is so important that we need to have a structure into what we're asking this guy Walker because he's a fountain of knowledge. He may look like he's only 20 years old, like he just got out of college, but this guy knows what he's talking about when it comes to sound isolation and room acoustics in general. So Walker, my first question I want to ask you is what portion of your business deals with home theater versus commercial? Yeah, so we are about 70% uh, commercial, about 30% residential home theaters right now. Well, we're hoping to change that because with these series of videos we're doing with the AudioHulk Smart Home, we want to get you more focused on on uh, local and home theater related type products. Yeah, we're excited. Yeah, we have a lot of ideas. This guy, this guy has some ideas, and not just home theater, but home in general. I mean, there's family rooms, media rooms, places in a home where some strategic acoustic treatments or application can can change the the feel of the whole room. Totally. We really truly can. Awesome. Yep. Yep. So the next question I want to ask you is, do you feel that soundproofing is often overlooked as a tweak for home theater? And if so, how come? Yeah, so I'll tell you, we usually get brought in as an afterthought, after framing, after a lot of things that should be integrated into the overall acoustic design and approach. Especially um, from amateurs. Especially amateurs, man. People doing things that, you know, if we had been brought in a week or two weeks earlier, could be greatly reduced in cost. It could be cheaper to have an IST, high STC wall uh, if it's done correctly. Uh, we see a lot of uh, audio holics, audio files wanting to... Um, spend a lot of money on their speakers and their other acoustic treatments, but if you don't isolate it, it's not really useful. Right, so we're talking about two stages here, just to be clear, we're talking about sound isolation to get your room quieter, to increase your dynamic range of your room, and to keep that sound from going to your neighbors or to your, you know, to the adjacent rooms in your house. And then we're talking the next level of doom and room acoustics, which you guys are familiar with in terms of tuning your room to have better sound. So the next question I want to ask you, um, soundproofing can lower the noise floor of a room, which is what we just said. Can you tell us some of the advantages of doing this? Why would someone want to do this? I kind of already answered that, but it would be good to get your perspective on what you feel when you step into a room that's been sound isolated, sound isolated versus one that hasn't been. Yeah, so it's kind of funny. Uh, as audioholics, you guys are focused on the dynamic range in the room, which is a term we use all the time for speech privacy or speech comfort. Uh, usually when we get called in, it's the other rooms in the house. Like you, if you've got your source side and your receive side, we're worried about the kids' rooms, the main, or master bedroom, the office, other kind of sensitive areas where you want that high STC or high transmission loss wall so you're not distracting the neighbors and your other roommates or what have you. Gotcha. Okay, so the next question I want to ask you is can a room be retrofitted to, to actually have soundproofing put into it after the fact, after the drywall has already been put up? Yeah, uh, no, it really can't. Uh, I hate telling people this because we do a lot of acoustic treatments. We do a lot of sound masking and it things. can, it's just economically unfeasible. Exactly. The, the cost goes up 20 fold for soundproofing, sound isolation. Now sound treatment, acoustic treatment, you can do that after market all, all day long. Put some panels on the wall, do a fabric wall or whisper wall type of job. But for sound isolation, it really needs to be done during construction. Yeah, I got you. You know, it's funny, anytime someone comes into my theater room that's in my existing house, the first thing they ask me, oh, your room is soundproofed. I go, no, actually, it's not soundproof. I built that house in 2005. I wasn't even thinking about soundproofing back then. All I wanted to do was have a good acoustic space. Mm -hmm. And when the bass hits in my house or when music is blasting in my house, the entire house becomes part of that experience. Mm -hmm. And that's something what we're trying to fix in the AudioHawk Smart Home 2.0 is we're getting to it now before the house is built, before the drywall is up, in the framing stages, using your products and some other techniques we'll be talking about in future videos. Mm -hmm. So the next question I want to ask, for, for many, cost of adding sound isolation is very abstract, unlike other audio upgrades. Can you provide like a rough estimate as to how much it adds to the cost of the room to add reasonable sound isolation? We're not talking about making like a panic room, mm -hmm. but something that will actually give you some sound isolation. Yeah, and it, two options here. You can 
up the cost or you can take up more space in the walls. We talked about staggered studs and double studs. Really not that much more expensive. Um, much more effective than double and triple layering drywall. Uh, we're big fans of mass loaded vinyl. They decouple and they add mass. Um, but if you can afford extra space, it can be very cheap. If you can't, you're looking at ISO clips, uh, sound dampening systems, and that can get a lot more expensive. Yep. Um, so to give you a range though, as you requested, um, three to five dollars per square foot is a good starting number and depending on the construction of the home um it may be twice that gotcha okay moving on some uh sound isolation and room acoustic absorption are often conflated this is what we were talking about before can you provide some key differences related to isolating a room acoustically versus treating an interior of acoustics Big mistake that a lot of people make. It's just like you mentioned, hey, your room's soundproofed. Well, it's really not. That's an acoustic treatment panel. That's gonna help with the reverb. It's gonna help with the, um, with the uh, reverb timer decay rate in the space. It's not gonna help like with sound. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, so it's going to help you a lot. It's going to sound crisper in the space. It won't make one iota of difference. Uh, we see some companies out there trying to sell people panels and they're saying, hey, if you can hear your neighbor, just put 10 panels in your bedroom and it'll help. Well, you can put 10 million panels in your bedroom. It won't help one bit. Um, so what we focus on is what are your needs? Do you need to isolate in the home theaters? Generally, yes. And then do you need to acoustically treat? That's done with a soft, porous material rather than a heavy, dense material that helps reflect the sound. Okay, so here's a quick question that you can answer very fast so you don't even need to pass the mic over. When you sound isolate a room, does that block all the sound from coming out of the room or is there a certain amount of sound that it's going to block? Right, so certainly not all. Um, there's no such thing as 100% soundproof, but when you start hitting STC's uh, sound transmission classes of 65 to 70, at that point you're blocking the vast majority of sound. And at that point you stop worrying about STC and start looking at those problematic frequencies, the 50 hertz and 63 hertz one, one third octave bands. Gotcha. Okay. So basically translating that to normal people speak, you treat, the, you treat the walls of the room so sound doesn't come out. You treat the interior of the room to control the sound inside of the room. And that's kind of the difference. There are two separate things. A lot of people get that confused, put some acoustic treatments inside. It doesn't help, it does nothing to do with the transmission of sound outside of the room. Correct. The system that he does is amazing. I mean, yeah, do you hear a little bit from it? I mean, it's nominal. It truly is. Yeah, I got it. All right, so here's kind of a long-winded question. Many in the home theater market are familiar with the use of green glue, MLV, isolation clips, and hat channel, multiple layers of drywall and insulation. You kind of touched on some of these. Mm -hmm. Can you explain what role each of these materials play in soundproofing a room? Sure, uh, I'll keep it briefer than last time. <laughs> um, so first thing is the studs. A thousand percent do not use two by six studs at 16 inches on center we see drywall subs and framers all the time they think the strongest wall blocks the most sound at commercial acoustics we say the stiffest wall transmits the most sound okay so you could have two by six studs at 16 and be an STC 34 which is means you could hear a whisper through that wall you could hear a cat meow or walk around through that wall uh, it's not gonna be sufficient for your needs what you should first consider doing is moving to 24 inches on center, your studs, or going to a staggered stud wall, so a two by fours on a two by six base plate. Right there, you just upped it by about 15 points. Uh, next thing you wanna do is obviously have some bat insulation in that wall. Uh, those are R-rated values, R13, R19. Um, it's not sound bat, we hear that a lot as well, but just something in the wall that's gonna help absorb any of the resonance that's in that wall. Like a rock wall? A rock wall would be fine. Oftentimes we find that your standard fiberglass bat is just as effective. So do you want to keep that loosely fit in the wall? Because if you really compact and compress that, it's going to make sound transmission even less effective. A hundred percent. You do not want a heavy, rigid fiberglass bat. Sometimes we're, they're called fiberglass blankets in that wall. You're actually better off having it loose fitting and woven between the studs. And that's what's going to absorb the resonance, but it's not going to bridge or ground the two drywall assemblies. You know, one thing I want to ask you too, is I'm noticing that the builders these days are only using half inch drywall instead mm -hmm. of five eighth inch. So if they're only going to use half inch drywall, um, 
Is it better to use two layers of drywall and then put a layer of green glue between them? Or, is it, or should you really push them to get that 5 8 inch drywall and pay the upgrade? So uh, generally commercial construction, because they need the one hour fire ratings between adjacent dwellings, are going to require that 5 8 inch, type X it's called, uh, whereas res single family residential almost always defaults to half inch. I would strongly recommend requiring them to move to half, or to, excuse me, the 5 8 inch. It's not that much more expensive. And the labor to hang it is the same as half inch, so you're really not paying a big upgrade there. It's actually less labor to do 5 8 inch wall than have two layers of half inch wall. Significantly yeah. less. I got a question for you. So if um, one of our Audioholics uh, fans out there is building a room, building a house, can they email you their floor plans, then you can basically design something and show them how it's installed and send them the materials if they're across country? Yeah, I think our best value for uh, for your fan base is to work with Audioholics and create content like this because we can answer a lot of those questions. Uh, what you guys do is way over my head. I don't know anything about speakers, um, but what we're good at is blocking sound and absorbing it, and that's the kind of information we want to get out there. Um, but so lastly, when you start looking at specialty products, you've got your isolation clips, your green glues. You want to start with the framing, the bat insulation, and the drywall. And and then you want to consider products like massively vinyl. How they work is you're adding a layer of heavy duty products similar to that second layer of drywall. So it adds a lot of mass, but it also decouples in the same way that the staggered stud does because it gets the drywall off of the wood stud. So now you're adding mass and you're decoupling at the same time and that's how you're getting the best bang for your buck. Gotcha. That's okay. a very dense material as well. Yes, it's one eighth inch thick, but it's one pound per square foot. So that's, that tells very you the density. Yeah. The one thing I wanted to add as a, as a last point to this discussion is when we're talking about drywall, if you do go with two layers of drywall, it's very important that you put a layer of dampening between those drywall layers. And that's what we're talking about with green glue. If you don't do that, what happens is if you make that wall really rigid, all the standing waves in the room become amplified. And you can see this in Dr. Floyd Toole's book on sound reproduction. He shows a layer of drywall versus two layers of drywall that aren't damped. And when you have that second layer of drywall sandwiched on top of that first layer, all the standing waves go way up, which makes the base even more uneven and makes it harder to control room modes, even when you're using multi-sub and you're using EQ base trapping, all that stuff. So that's a very important point I hope you guys realize when you're considering doing sound isolation in a room. So the other question I want to ask you, um, in the last question, we just discussed all those different products. Sure. Do you need all of them? Or do you think we could just get by with like a basic, if we just do like an MLV shell in the room, is that good enough for most people to get decent amount of sound isolation for their theaters? Yes, on the staggered stud assembly of one layer of mass of vinyl, the wall blocker, which we have lab tested on that exact assembly, will get you an STC 55, and that will be sufficient for the vast majority of people's needs. Uh, in the smart home, uh, you guys have the joist system above, so we're talking about some isolation hangers and things like that. So various people may have various needs, and you have a very specific speaker system going in there, so we're going to kind of, you know, deck yours out. But in other cases, simply one full layer of uh, a massively vinyl type product should be sufficient on the correct stud assembly. For most people's needs, that will probably be more than sufficient. Exactly, you know, exactly. Dumb that down a little bit, that sound. Mm -hmm. So the last question I want to talk to you about are, what are flanking paths, and what should we care about these things? What are they? Yeah, so flanking paths are ways that sound gets get around the primary partition. It's almost always the door or windows, uh, but within the home, it's gonna be your door. So you guys are talking about going to a double door system, uh, both solid core. You don't have to spend the three to 5,000 bucks on the high STC rated door, but you'll get 80% uh, to 90% of its performance. Um, you always wanna have seals and sweeps. If you can put a piece of paper under that door, that means air is getting underneath and that means sounds not having to go through that mass loaded vinyl wall it's just going straight under the door so do a light check do a paper test just make sure it's airtight and you're not letting sound bypass all that hard work you just did so the advantage guys i was looking at doors as an option acoustically treated doors the ones that are specific for sound isolation those doors run like three grand mm -hmm. 
They're super expensive. Yeah, yeah. Okay. If you want anything above an STC rating of 36, you're going to spend several thousand dollars. So the cheap solution, like uh, like Walker was just saying, is to do two jo two doors, two solid core doors separated by a six or an eight inch air gap, mm -hmm. and that's going to get us where we need to be. Mm -hmm. So the question I have for you is, can I take a regular solid core door? and put a layer of MVL on it, and would that give me better um, sound isolation? Yeah, the, the MLV, the Maslow, the vinyl, right? Yep. Uh, so what you can do, that's not a bad option, but it needs to be 100% coverage. Uh, you can't just put it like on one of the panes or halfway up the door. Uh, what In acoustics, we call it the 1% rule. A 1% opening lets in 50% of the sound. So only treat the door if you're going to treat the whole thing. Okay, so that's a pretty involving thing. Maybe we'll consider doing that or not. It would yeah. depend on what we're going to do is after this room is built, we're going to be doing acoustical measurements in the room and just to see how effective everything has become. We're going to have a Walker come several times actually. We're going to go visit the builder before the framing is done just to make sure everything is done to the standard, to audioholic standard. Mm -hmm. That way this guy, if, if he breaks wind in my theater room, you're not going to hear it in the kitchen. Right? Barking spiders. <laughs> Well, guys, I hope you enjoyed this video. Please thumb it up. Make sure you subscribe to the channel. There'll be lots of more opportunities to talk to Walker in the future. Put your comments down below if you have any questions related to sound isolation or room acoustics. Either Walker will step in, I'll step in, or we'll even get this guy to step in, in small doses, of course. <laughs> So guys, don't forget about our Patreon channel at patreon.com slash audioholics. You should become a Patreon member, especially now when we're doing all these kind of educational seminars on sound isolation, room acoustics, home automation. Yeah, there's, there's just so many opportunities. We are going to be shoving this stuff down your throat for the next year, teaching you guys how to build the true Audioholics level showcase home. We want you guys to experience what we're experiencing. Yeah, we talked about the trickle-down technology kind of funny last time but we did so all these things we're doing at max level the audio system the room treatment but there's always layers that that you can pull off to fit your budget and take something from this to make your system the best it can be for the budget that you have to do it with yep all right guys well we appreciate you watching this video walker i appreciate you being here today don as well we got some real heavyweights here i'm really very happy that we have this kind of support doing this project and until next time my friends keep listening so this is acoustically transparent material i'm going to a flashlight behind it a lot of people think they put cloth or material on a wall, a carpet, and they think that that's going to control the sound, that it's absorbent. When, if you don't use acoustic, a porous, acoustically transparent material like this, then the sound will just reflect off of it, and you might as well have. It's like people, when they want to put a rug or a carpet in their room, they think that's absorbent, when the reality is, it's more like a micro diffuser and spreads that sound out a little bit. But this is something that you're gonna find on your professionally built acoustic panels. Or if you're doing a cabinet and you're putting speakers in a cabinet, you wanna use some kind of acoustically transparent grill cloth or material like this.